Here we go. 50,000 thoughts a day? Did you know, according to the National Science Foundation, the average human being has about 50,000 thoughts per day? Despite this, we as a society and as individual thinkers know next to nothing about what thoughts actually are or even where they come from. Because of this, we almost never question their contents by asking the deeper questions, such as, should I believe everything that pops into my head? Are my thoughts a reflection of who I am as a person? Am I the voice behind these thoughts? See, the last question is a tough one, since the very asking of it appears to be a contradiction. After all, I am using that voice behind my thoughts to ask myself whether or not that voice is me, right? This paradox usually stops the question from ever being asked in the first place. And this could be because we are conditioned to believe that we are the voice in our heads. It's a reasonable enough conclusion, right? I am the only one who experiences my thoughts after all. And what could be a better indicator of who I am than the images and words that appear in my personal mental space? It's kind of a no-brainer. What could represent my true self better than the internal dialogue that narrates and interprets every moment of my day? But to answer this question, we must return to the previous question of where do thoughts come from? There are two major theories about what generates thoughts. One of these theories, what I might call the, um, actually it's what it, it is called, the self-created theory, is predominantly a Western perspective on the subject. And uh, the second major theory we will call the mind-created theory, and it's more abundantly found in Eastern schools of philosophy. You can probably already see where this is going. The self-created theory argues that you are the voice behind your thoughts. According to this theory, your thoughts are a direct extension of your ego or identity. Your character, personality, likes and dislikes, all that stuff. So within this model, if one were to have a thought that's considered by society or religion to be impure, a sinful thought, this impure thought would be considered a direct reflection of the type of person you truly are. Or, I guess, could be the work of Satan. Who knows? <laughs> Self-created theory is the theory that most of us grow up subscribed to, especially if we grew up in a religious household. Those who believe in this theory, consciously or not, tend to be vulnerable to feelings of shame and inadequacy because they feel personally responsible for each and every thought that arises in their head, even those thoughts that contradict their deepest moral convictions. So... The self-created theory also proposes that there is no randomness in the thoughts you experience. If you have a nefarious or disgusting thought, then that is supposedly something nefarious and disgusting about you expressing itself through thought form. So your characters and morals and desires are immediately put into question. In other words, every thought is a direct reflection of who you are. As you can see, this way of thinking has a tendency to produce negative consequences for the perceived thinker. Everything from neuroticism to narcissism um, can be born from this way of seeing ourselves. This theory puts a tremendous amount of weight on the assumed thinker of thoughts and tends to cause more attention to be given to the negative thoughts than the positive ones. This is because thoughts carry an enormous amount of shock value when you assume that they stem from the core of yourself which makes the bad thoughts infinitely more disturbing and uh, possibly scarring the psyche. So due to the very nature of the way that the self-created theory operates, I find it to be an exhausting and terrifying way to think. It's not for me. Um, if you subscribe to it, totally fine. Not my thing. To be perpetually ambushed and criticized by my own mind and constantly deduce shameful conclusions about my character does not sound like a good time to me. Nobody has a immaculate mind. There is so much outside stimulus that affects the contents of our thoughts. It's ridiculous to me to think that it's all coming from a sense of 100% self, you, something inside of you, making that happen. No, these are things, in my opinion, that are subtly accumulated 
in the external world and they find an outlet through the mental holes in our consciousness. That might be a weird way of putting it, but so the alternative theory, which is what I tend to subscribe to, um, is the mind created theory. And, um, this theory states that instead of being the creator of thoughts, you are a witness to them as they occur. This theory also insists that thoughts are random, involuntary suggestions generated by the brain rather than definitive reflections about the nature of who you are. Obviously, there's some wiggle room with free will there. You can kind of produce certain types of thoughts, although some people claim to choose a thought, you'd have to think a thought before a thought. So I don't know. Nobody has all the answers, but... As it is the job of the lungs to breathe, or the stomach's job to digest food, the human brain is an organ which is just tasked with generating thoughts, in my opinion. It's just what it does. These thoughts are not personal in the way that the self-created theory would suggest. And even though we experience a thought monologue nearly 24-7, they are not necessarily a representation of our inner self. As Alan Watts puts it, the mind grows thoughts as a field grows grass. Once again, it's just what it does. If you lived your whole life as someone who believes themselves to be the voice in your head, you probably will have a lot of resistance to believing in this theory. And that's okay. The self-created theory is a hard one to let go of, since you're not just letting go of the negative thoughts about yourself, you're also letting go of identifying with the positive thoughts as well. Rupert Spira was once confronted by a listener experience the same resistance, and I think his response sums it up nicely. Uh, love or hate Rupert Spira. I, th- I think he has some upsides and some downsides, but um, I think he gets this. Quote, in retrospect, we look at the succession of thoughts and a thought, which is just thought number 10, looks back and imagines that there is a chooser in the system between each thought. That chooser is just thought number 10. It's not actually there in between each thought. The chooser itself is not there in between each thought, choosing each time between a range of possibilities and saying, I'll have this thought next, or then I'll have this thought. The notion of a chooser is simply itself a thought, which, as you say, appears retrospectively. The thought that says, I was there in between each thought choosing it, it's the clown that takes the bow. (laughs) Right? It wasn't actually present but it claims responsibility afterwards. As Spira suggests, the notion of a chooser of thoughts is itself just another thought. It does not exist as an independent entity. There is no real chooser of thoughts, and the assumption that there is a chooser is simply just another thought. Sam Harris, once again, love him or hate him, nicely echoes Spira's conclusions. We are not authoring our thoughts. We can't choose them before we think them. That would require that we think them before we think them. So the mind creative theory concludes that instead of creating thought, we simply experience it. We don't get to decide which thought bubbles up to the surface and which sinks to the bottom of the mental lake. This confusing suggestion is actually nicely summarized by a guy named David Kane. He says, quote, almost all of our thoughts are involuntary, just like how we can't help but hear sounds that happen near us. Yeah. Can I hear it? No. I'm recording right now. (laughs) Quote, almost all of our thoughts are involuntary. Just like how we can't help but hear sounds that happen near us or see whatever objects appear in front of us as we move through the world, thought is like any other sense in this way, and it's helpful to think of it as one. Thoughts simply emerge into your present moment without any invitation from you. If we include thought as a sense, then it's the most prominent one of all. We're having thoughts nearly all the time, all day, and they easily take over our attention and trigger emotions in us, whether we want them to or not. If we really take a close look at the experience of mingling our identity with the contents of our thought, we will discover that this is the source of most of our suffering. I kid you not. This identification with thought causes us to take our lives overly serious and leaves us at the mercy of emotional reactions triggered by random thoughts because we can't control what we think. This self-created theory puts its faith in an unreliable ruler 
who spends more time stumbling around in the dark corners of its own mind than in the light of reality. But if we can learn to acknowledge that thought is randomly and spontaneously emerging from the river of memories that is our own mind, and that we did not purposefully create them in most cases, we free ourselves from their weight. Suddenly we don't have to hold on to thoughts. We don't have to grasp for them, scold them, criticize them, or even feel ashamed about them. We realize we don't have to waste our energy engaging with every thought that arises. There's no reason to. They don't belong to us. We can simply observe them as they appear, and then watch them fade into the void. A lifelong subscriber to the self-created theory of thought might find that adopting the mind-creative theory leaves a large gap in one's identity. And I understand this. If I'm not my thoughts, who am I? I can't answer this question for you, but I'll ask you this. Isn't the question, who am I, just another thought? In other words, you might not be the one who asked the question, but you are the one that knows the answer. Yeah, sit with that for a few minutes. Thanks for listening. Stay tuned.